Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. Chris, I'm excited. Who have we got on today? Hi, Alina. You're, you're sounding well tonight. Uh, yeah, so tonight we have uh, Chloe Melas, who is a reporter for NBC and is the granddaughter of Frank Murphy, whose wartime experience with the 8th Air Force is brought to us in her book, The Luck of the Draw. Chloe, welcome to History Hack. How are you? I am great. I'm in New York City right now on a train, so forgive the background noise. Uh, that's fine, right? Hopefully you can't hear my washing machine in the background. <laughs> but um, we should we should get straight down to it. So what was Frank's pre-war like? You know, my grandfather grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, Southern, Southern gentleman, um, honestly, one of the best human beings I've ever met in my entire life. He was enrolled at Emory University. He was in, uh, he was going to school when uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor took place. And uh, he considered himself to be a, a patriot and uh, he wanted to serve his country. And so that's when he immediately enlisted and he wanted to be a pilot, actually. But he grew up in, in Atlanta. He took flying lessons um, and he writes about that in the book. He always had a love of airplanes. He was uh, the middle of three boys. All of these boys enlisted. Um, but he was the only one that served in the Air Force and also became a prisoner of war. Um, he had two lovely parents, and unfortunately, they died uh, each of heart attacks uh, in their 50s. Um, so unfortunately, I never got to, to meet them. But my grandfather, he was a devout Catholic. His family is of Irish descent, given the Murphy, and he was very, very proud of that. He also had some English um, and some German blood as well. And he, he was just a humble, incredible, incredible man. And he also was really into music and he played, uh, music growing up. He played the clarinet. Um, and he actually played in the prisoner of war band. And he writes about that in the book too. So music was a big, always a big part of his life. Um, and you know, he was a bit of an overachiever. He was the, class president <laughs> in Atlanta. He was the captain of the football team. So he was uh, kind of one of those people that like you love to hate, <laughs> but he was such a nice guy. I know from my own grandparents that there was a mixed reception to war. One of my granddads was already a pre-regular, pre-war regular. So he was just sort of, oh, here we go. And the other granddad was very excited. How how did how did Frank feel about, about the commencement of the war? You know, trepidation. Um, but again, you know, just patriotism, wanting to serve his country, knowing that if he did not enlist, there would be a draft or or he thought there would be a draft. And so he, he wanted to be an officer um, and he he knew that it was his he was a very, you know, he kept his emotions very tight. And even later in life, you know, he never raised his voice. He never got upset. You never really knew really how he was feeling, <laughs> which was good and bad. Um, so if he had strong political opinions, it wasn't something he really shared. So he goes into the Air Force. <laughs> and I was a sidestep, but my, my granddad that also uh, tried to join the Air Force, but at six foot, they told him he was too tall. <laughs> so he had to join the infantry instead. But um, Frank goes into the Air Force. What kind of training does he get? I mean, quite a bit of training. Um, I mean, about two years of training where they are all across the United States learning how to fly these planes. And he's told pretty early on that his eyesight just isn't good enough and that they had a shortage of navigators. And would he consider being a navigator? Because he was very, very smart. And he, again, he wanted to be an officer. So that was a big draw for him because if you're a navigator, you're an officer. Um, and so he went all around the United States and he was, he was moved to different places during this training, gave him opportunities to go home though, and, and see his family during this time, uh, forged some relationships and then eventually became part of the 100th and sent over, um, sent over to England. But he spends a 
pretty good part of um, the book writing about the fact that this gave him the chance to see the American West, uh, to go to places where he had really never traveled outside of Atlanta, Georgia. So this was his opportunity to really see the country. And then, of course, some, eventually he goes overseas and it's his first time leaving the country. So what aircraft were they flying in the uh, in the training period? Yeah, so, you know, in about August of 1942, after uh, he leaves his training uh, in Florida, he arrives um, and begins training on, training on these B-17s. And you know, they're really getting experience with the B-17s. And he writes in the book earlier where they're training on BT-13 aircrafts um, and then PT-17 trainers. And he writes about uh, Charles Cruikshank, who's known as Crankshaft, is his nickname, uh, who's the pilot of his plane. And you see him quite heavily in Masters of the Air in several of those episodes. Definitely look out for him. And I got to meet the actor who actually plays him in Masters of the Air. But yeah, I mean, eventually by 1942, they're training on B-17s. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely come back to circle back to Masters of the Air <laughs> at the end. I'm quite excited to watch that and get, and get your thoughts on it. So you've mentioned the, the 100th Bomb Group. Uh, who, were, who were they? Well, you know, if you read my grandfather's book, he says that they are a ragtag group of young men. Um, and, you know, they served under the American 8th Air Force during World War II. They were originally founded in Savannah, Georgia, um, and uh, World War II, which I'm assuming all of your listeners do, they know that the 8th Air Force is comprised of various bomb groups, and my grandfather was arbitrarily assigned to the 100th, a group that at one point wasn't even clear that this group was going to even go to England because they weren't sure that they were ready. And then, of course, in my opinion, they go on to become one of the most famous groups. Our, our British listeners will, because we, we don't really get taught, taught much about the Americans, our Air Force during the war in Europe, we sort of talk about our guys going over at night time. So what what sort of thing were the USAAF, I'll make sure I get the right amount of A's, what was their sort of role in the war over German-occupied territory? I mean, the main role of the 8th Air Force, these young American boys, was to make things really difficult for Hitler and his men. And what I mean by that is whether it was bombing railroad stations or ball bearing factories, um, you know, just like my grandfather, he was bombing a railway station in Munster when he was shot down on October 10th uh, during Black Week. And these missions were done during the day. These were daylight bombing missions, and it had never been done before. And quite controversial, which my grandfather writes about in the book, because these men, as he says, were like sitting ducks. And that's why so many of them died, uh, because, you know, you could see them a lot better during the day than you could see them at night. So incredibly dangerous situations. And just as I'm sure for the British, these were unpressurized airplanes. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in a B-17. I have one from World War II. Um, they're very tight. They're very uncomfortable. These navigator stations, if you are a navigator, you are doing this very rudimentary with maps and tools. There are no, you know, computer systems, obviously, in these airplanes. Um, sometimes you're just really looking outside in the sky to figure out, is that France? Is that Germany? Is, uh, you know, wh where are we exactly? And, and obviously sometimes you get lost too. So a lot of pressure, um, on the navigator, you know, people are getting air sick, um, up there. And these guys eventually jumping out of parachute, sh jumping out of airplanes with parachutes, if they're lucky, uh, many of them never having done something like that. Uh, which is also equally terrifying. You didn't even always have your parachute with you. It was maybe packed somewhere else in the plane and you're jumping out and sometimes it gets caught in the engine or maybe it's tangled or does it open correctly. Um, so incredibly just unbelievable conditions. And again, it kind of goes back to the title of my grandfather's book, Luck of the Draw. I mean, it's like my grandfather says, you either, either had a bullet on your name or you didn't. Uh, so a bullet with your name on it or you didn't, you know, so... 
Absolutely. I mean, um, cause I've, I've stu- I study RAF bombers in the early part of the war and it's, it's just an absolute, it's terrifying. I don't know how they do it. And that's without factoring in that you've got the Germans shooting at you with 109s and 88 black batteries. But before we get to that, uh, what, like you said, Frank hadn't really left Georgia. What, how did he, what did he think of Britain when he first arrived? Well, you know, it was an exciting moment to be able to go overseas. Um, but. <laughs> Obviously, he didn't like the food all that much. Unfortunately, sorry to say, he wasn't the biggest fan um, of British food. But, you know, they really just had these weekend passes. They were in Thorpe Abbotts in this beautiful countryside um, Air Force base. And I've been to Thorpe Abbotts twice. It's It looks like something out of a storybook. So it's farmland and cows and farmers and, um, you know, quite quite the essence of tranquility. Um, and that was his first experience of these rolling hills and seeing the, the mountains from the sky and, and the sea. Um, and he paints it quite beautifully. It was just these weekend passes where they could go into the city and they'd go to jazz clubs and these nightclubs, these speakeasies and, you know, a lot of alcohol. My grandfather writes of, you know, Men obviously meeting women over there. He doesn't write about that experience if, if he, if he had any. It's a very PG book, I must say. And, you know, I think it, it, there wasn't a lot of time to have a lot of fun, but he does write about going to London on those weekend passes. And, um, it was another world, world for, for him. And then obviously, you know, later after Regensburg, he lands in Northern Africa and he, uh, I have a photo of him, uh, in Morocco that hangs in my office at work. I have one at my office at home. And, uh, obviously that was quite an experience to go to Africa because obviously that was the furthest away from home he'd ever been. Yeah, absolutely. I can imagine. Um, and I'll give him a free pass on the food because there are some very strange meals that you can have over here. And I've, I've a good well, you know, I, I do, I do want to say, I mean, like he writes in the book, you know, when he was in combat, you know, um, or when he was in Stalag Luf three, I mean, they would dream of the spam sandwiches and the hot chocolate and the warm soft beds that awaited them. And he writes in the book, despite the trauma of combat that left us quaking, rubber legged and with the sensation that someone poured ice down the backs of our shirts, most of us felt that the only way we could go home with any honor was to pull our necks in like turtles and endure it. Yeah, I never got, in, got on with Spam. <laughs> I suppose if you sat in Stalag Gloom 3, there is that sort of yearning for home, I guess. But so he was in, he was involved in the campaign through the summer of 43. What was it, what was his experiences in that with like his uh, first flight out? I mean, the first few were uneventful. Um, it was really, uh, Bremen, Regensburg, uh, that were the toughest. Uh, you know, obviously, LeMay, uh, had said, Curtis LeMay, he had said that, um, everyone who was a part of Regensburg should be awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, something my grandfather never received, and I'm on a mission now to see if I can get it awarded to him posthumously. But terrifying, loud, freezing, take your gloves off, you get frostbite. He was injured uh, during Munster uh, shrapnel in his shoulder, shrapnel he had in his shoulder till the day he died. He would always set off the metal detectors at the airport. Um, you know, these oxygen masks, uh, you know, at one point my great my father removes his oxygen mask during Regensburg so that he can go get extra bullets. Um, and I think that scene is in Masters of the Air, and it's when he's flying with John Egan, who obviously is a big, big part of this show played by Callum Turner. I've seen all the episodes. It's absolutely amazing. It's so hard for me to try to put this, obviously, all into words, since obviously I, I wasn't there. Um, but really terrifying. I'm assuming my grandfather had some p- version of post-traumatic stress. Um, I, I had written about it when I was at CNN and he didn't talk about it. And I think that writing this book was a catharsis for him. Um, and I think he had a really hard time with the fact that on the day that his plane went down, two of the men died, a radio operator and tail, a tail gunner. And actually I want to try to find those families. Um, I was thinking about it the other day, so I, I'd like to try to to try to find find those family members. Um, but Black Week was October eighth, 
uh, through the 14th of 1943. Um, and it was uh, an unprecedented moment uh, for the 8th Air Force when it came to aerial warfare. Um, and a lot of men died. And that is why it's called Black Week. Um, and ironically, I was in England uh, during the anniversary of Black Week. I don't know if it was like the 50th anniversary. I've, I've lost track. I'm bad at math if you guys want to tell me. But I was there this past October, and I was at Thorpe Abbott's the day that he was shot down, October 10th. I'd like to think that that was not a coincidence. But I, I was I was there. Wild. Wow, wow. yeah. That, that is quite a... Quite, I was going to say coincidence, but almost kismet sort of thing but um he's um he was also involved in the schweinfurt raid that was the that was the ball bearing factory wasn't it yes and you know what's interesting is that now that i am 37 years old and i've really kind of delved into in detail of what he went through he was a part of several instrumental missions right and again it's just that's what also makes my grandfather's story so unique is that he was a part of regensburg and munster and schweinfurt and he lived to tell the tale. And it's very rare, right, outside of historians to have somebody who was there to write a first person account. Um, and that's what makes grandpa's book so special. And that's really the reason why I went to such great lengths to get the book published, because it's, it's a story that needs to be told. I mean, look, I love Don Miller. He's become a friend and Masters of the Air is incredible. You know, but when you look at books like what Harry Crosby did with a wing and a prayer, um, and he's a huge part of Masters of the Air, and he ended up becoming the lead navigator of the 100th Bomb Group. Um, and when you have these personal accounts and to listen to Frank Murphy talk about being in Stalag Luf 3 when the Great Escape actually is happening, like he was there the night the Great Escape happened, right? I mean, I just wish he was here so that I could pepper him with a million more questions. I lived to know my grandfather until I was 20 years old, so I did get a lot of questions in, <laughs> but obviously not the types of things I would be asking him today. Yeah, I think that that's quite a common thing. Um, I wish my granddad was had so many more questions that <laughs> 20 years later, I really wish I'd thought about at the time. Um, so yeah, I completely understand. And I suddenly remember what I was going to say. The thing with Black Week, that a lot of people forget when they when you say, oh, a bomber was shot down, you say, oh, that's one plane. But with the American planes, you've got 10 crew in each one. So I think there was one particular day where they lost 10 B-17s and everyone said, oh, it's only 10, but that's 100 men killed in one go. So it's quite it's quite horrifying. Yeah, and you know what's interesting is that the only plane that came back that day of Regensburg was Rosie's Riveters flown by Rosie Rosenthal, whose son Dan was the president of the 100th Bomb Group Foundation for years, and he's become a best friend of mine. So how crazy is, is, is all of that? And what a small world. And, you know, I wish that my grandfather knew that I was friends with these family members of, you know, Blakely and the Egans and the Crosbys all of these decades later. It's funny how life comes full circle. But, you know, obviously a very, very terrifying moment for my grandfather. And he, you know, writes about how, how his left arm and shoulder, uh, you know, he had numerous shrapnel wounds when, when the plane was hit, um, and was going down, right? And he was just in this state of complete shock. And, and then obviously, you know, rolling his ankle when he finally lands in his parachute and he's in terrible pain, can barely walk. Um, and then these German farmers are coming over to him, um, and he's trying to explain to them that he, he's an American you know, and then they take him in to a farmhouse to bandage him up. And then eventually they have to call the German police um, and turn him over. And actually later in life, he went back to become friends with those farmers. He went back to where he was oh. shot down and he became friends with them. And he ended up being pen pals with them for, for years. Oh, wow. That's really nice. I don't know. Things get changed later. You end up with a tariff league of rules and things. So to, to be, Caught by, captured by nice, nice people is a good thing, <laughs> and it's good that they went on to have that relationship. Uh, yeah, and in, in in the book there are photos of my grandfather going back to the crash site, um, and he shows pictures of uh, those uh, family members 
uh, who had found him. There was actually a young boy in the town who saw the air battle over Munster, who ended up taking a drawing, a picture, a painting. Um, and gave it to my grandfather decades later when my grandfather original version of Luck of the Draw that he self-published for the family. And I actually gave a print to Jonas Moore, who plays my grandfather in Masters of the Air last week in California. So we've talked about Munster and his, his capture, but what was it like being shot down? You know, I think it would be great if I read you a portion of his book uh, from the chapter Munster. My grandfather writes, we completed our bomb run dropped our bombs, and began a long, gradual left turn to our rally point with the 95th and 390th bomb groups. I looked out of my left window and saw a B-17 about 500 to 600 feet below us, falling away steeply, with its left wing enveloped in sheets of red and yellow flames. A large white square with, was painted on both sides of the vertical stabilizer's upper portion and on the right upper wingtip area. Inside the square, the capital letter D. The identification for the 100th bomb group was painted in insignia blue. As we turned away from the city, the Luftwaffe fighters returned with a vengeance. We seemed to be all alone. Moments later, as I was firing the left nose gun at the attacking German fighters, a violent explosion just behind me and to my left sent me crashing to the floor. I immediately felt a burning sensation in my left arm and shoulder as they began to ache and go numb. I knew I had been hit. As I struggled to stand up, slipping and sliding on expended shell casings, Augie Gaspar turned and vigorously motioned with the palm of his right hand down for me not to get up. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw someone coming down through the floorboard door from the pilot's compartment. It was Glenn Graham. He had taken off his oxygen mask. He motioned with his right arm that I was to follow him, pulled the emergency release handle on the forward crew door, kicked it away, and bailed out. I was aghast as I watched him rapidly drop away and disappear behind the airplane. I had not heard the alarm bell under the navigator's table go off and saw that my intercom controls were shot away, but I knew it was all over. We were going down. I clipped on my parachute chest pack, crawled to the door, and dangled my feet in the opening. The countryside, 20,000 feet below me, was a vast, multicolored checkerboard of dark strips of forest and rich green fields, neatly and meticulously laid out. But it looked a 100 miles away. I eased out the door with my hands at my sides. The earth was spinning around me. I realized I was tumbling. I shut my eyes and waited until I felt sure I had cleared the airplane. Undoubtedly, no more than a matter of seconds. I jerked the D-ring of the, of the ripcord of my parachute so hard I have no idea what happened to it. A mass of material flashed in front of my face. Almost simultaneously, I heard a loud thwack sound and felt a sharp jerk as my fall was broken. Mercifully, my parachute had opened. I remembered looking at my watch. It was 3.10 in the afternoon. And so he goes on to write all about, you know, seeing an ME-109 fly near him. Um, and he was worried that he would get shot while, you know, in his parachute. And then when he lands in the field, this uh, German farmer, you know, they come over to him and they say, you know, for you, the war is over. And that's something that was, you know, commonly set to uh, POW or, you know, men when they were captured. Yeah, there's that. Uh, it's quite a stereotypical thing in, uh, in old war movies and British TV. Uh, for you, Tommy, the war is over. Uh, but in, for him, it was pretty much over. He ends up in, as you said, he ends up in Starleg Luft 3. So how, how did he spend the rest of the war in the, in the camp system? So he was a prisoner of war for the next 18 months, uh, most of which was spent in Starlog Luft 3. Um, where the great escape happened, and, and he writes about that, and, and he too was part of tunneling efforts on his side um, of the prison camp, um, and it was just a you know orderly prison camp, and how they ran things, and they rationed their food from their Red Cross parcels. Um, my grandfather played uh, clarinet in the prisoner of war band, um, and that that was very interesting. Um, and he says, you know, music saved his life. Uh, instruments had been sent over by the Red Cross. Um, and then he went on to go to Stalag 7A, and that was pretty, pretty hard with a march in sub-zero temperatures, uh, to Mooseburg. And many men died on that march. That's also part of Masters of the Air. So you actually see that march, and they were in boxcars for several days and nights on their journey. Um, but some really, really, you know, tough conditions. Um, obviously it could always have been a lot worse. He's lucky that he, lived to tell 
what had happened. And then eventually, you know, at the end of the war, he's like 120 something pounds. He dysentery, lice, pneumonia, um, but he gets to go home. Um, and he gets on a, on a ship after he's, uh, in France hospitalized, um, and, and goes home. But it's quite beautiful how he describes being liberated by General Patton, um, and how the prison camp was liberated and, and writes about that, um, and how Patton came over to his group of where he was standing and said to, to my grandfather and some men that, you know, I'm going to kill these sons of bitches for this. And, you know, some, some really poignant, poignant moments. I don't want to give it all away, but spoiler alert, he does survive. And, you know, it's, it's, there, there's parts of the book that are dense with a lot of, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of detail. Um, and then there's parts where he shows the telegraphs uh, that he wrote to his family and that they wrote back to him or the letters he wrote and the letters he received, you know, so, so there's a little bit of something in there for, for everyone. And, and I'm just happy to be able to shine a light on something that he spent 10 years writing. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and it, it reads very well. And like from the excerpt you've just read um, about him being shot down, the, our listeners will get an idea of the style and it, it's really worth reading. And we'll get on to plug that in a minute, but just briefly, because I'm kind of excited from the trailers, how, how, how good is Masters of the Air? It's not just good, it's fantastic. There are nine episodes. The tenth episode is a documentary, which you'll get to hear my grandfather first person. Um, my grandfather, he's in it. He's played by Jonas Moore. He's a supporting character. By no means is, he's, is, is he the star of this thing. Um, but I got to go to the set during the pandemic in England. It was, it was incredible. And it, look, it's incredible. The CGI is amazing. So, so much attention to detail. You know, nothing's going to make everyone who loves, uh, military history totally happy. I'm sure people will fl- find flaws with this uniform or this airplane, but I know the historians that work on this and work so hard and the costume designer calling Atwood and you know, I think like 3,000 fittings were done. There were that many actors. I think there's over like 300 speaking parts in the show. I mean, it's a monumental undertaking, and I think everyone is just going to really love it. Can I just add before Chris starts to speak that uh, John Orloff was obviously the creator of this, and I've done interviews with him, and he is absolutely fabulous, and I had such a great time, and I really trust John to be able to make it as close to the truth as possible and because when he did the Band of Brothers episode which obviously is my favourite and it's what inspired me to become a historian working on atrocities and the Holocaust which is obviously episode 9 and he worked such things into it let me rephrase it differently he made such complicated issues so simple and easy to understand for the average person that watches the TV programme I'm so sure that this is going to be absolutely fantastic because John would not, I mean, he's going to do it justice, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. So I have become very good friends with John Orloff. He is a fantastic, fantastic human being. Um, and he worked so hard on trying to get things right and doing these men justice. Um, and I'm telling you, it's, it's, Absolutely expletive here. Fantastic. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, uh, when you said it, oh, we, I'm sure there'll be some, we, we call the pe- those people, uh, stitch counters who sit there, and look at uniforms, go, well, I think you'll find that button is right. So we don't, we don't listen to them. I'm sure. And um, from all accounts I've heard and from the trailers, it looks really fantastic. So really looking forward to see it. But, uh, just before we go, would you like to remind everyone, uh, the title of, of the book, uh, where, and where they can get it? Cause it's out now, isn't it? Yes, and I'm sorry, I'm walking through the streets of New York City right now, and it's very loud where I am, so hopefully uh, listeners find that endearing. Sorry if you don't, I'm a working mom of two boys, and I'm, I'm, I'm walking in the freezing cold to my office, but it's called Luck of the Draw. It's available everywhere books are sold, and if you get the audio version instead, and you like to listen to your books be read to you, which I know I do, it's narrated by Jonas Moore, the actor who plays my grandfather in masters oh that's pretty cool it's uh narrated by the by the actor uh what we'll try and do is we'll try and get it on the uh history hack bookshop as well that way with every sale we get small amount of the money and you get more money than if it's sold through a uh rainforest named website <laughs> yeah and i and i'm just so glad that the money was able to go to the foundation and to the uh you know mighty eighth air force museum yeah that's a really worthy cause and a, and a good place for it to go 
But Chloe, thanks for coming on. It's been really, really good talking to you. Yes, me too. Thank you. And sorry for all my audio issues. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.